Hello, welcome to the ATC Double Cut. I'm Micah Woods, Chief Scientist at the Asian Turfgrass Center. Today, I'm going to talk about a couple posts on the blog. I call this a double cut because I discuss for a second time some of the material that I've written about today. I'm going to show one of the classic blog posts, or for me, it's a classic. It's something that I have been interested in and have been talking with people about. It's related to the growth rate and about getting the growth rate of the grass just right. If the grass grows too fast, that's quite a problem because you would have potentially scalping issues. I've seen some of those recently. And uh, depending on the type of grass, scalping can actually be a fatal problem. So you obviously don't want the grass growing so fast that it scalps. In this blog post, I showed a photo where um, the grass was growing too slow. And the title of the post, which I will put in the description in the show notes, the title is, it is easy to know when grass grows too slow. And I say that it is dangerous to grow grass too slow. And I show a picture of grass that's grown too slow. This was at a golf course in Osaka, Japan. It's creeping bent grass and it's pretty horrid conditions. There is algae all through the green. The grass is yellow, looks like it has some leaf spot disease or something. Ball marks are not repaired. And there is some pretty severe dollar spot, which is an indication that the grass is just growing too slow. Because it's so dangerous for the grass to grow too slow, I mentioned in this post something that, if you think about it, must be true. And what that is, is that, well, when grass, because grass dies when it grows too slow, I, I put in the, I'll, I'll read from my post, from, from what I wrote here, quote, because grass dies when it grows too slow, professional turf grass managers naturally keep the grass growing at a rate faster than that too slow rate. That makes sense because it it's a disaster. The grass will die. The conditions are completely unacceptable when the grass grows too slow. When the grass grows too fast, there are a lot of tools that professional turf grass managers have to deal with that. They can verticut to remove some of that extra material before they would scalp it with a mower. They can mow more frequently to prevent scalping. They can do more sand top dressing to deal with the organic matter that would be accumulating too much. There are a number of maintenance practices that can be done. Core aerification, um, more sand top dressing, more verticutting, more mowing. All of that can be done to create a great playing surface when the grass is growing a little bit too fast. And that's better than letting the grass grow too slow and be like those photos or like that photo that I showed where there is, where there are ball mark scars that have not recovered, where there is dollar spot that is not recovering and where there is algae on the surface because the grass is so thin, the turf is so thin. I think that this is important because it suggests that it would be a universal thing in professional turf grass management to be growing the grass a little bit faster than ideal because it's so dangerous to grow the grass too slow. We can consider that to be a failure point or a cliff, and we don't want to go off that cliff because that would be failure the turf conditions would be completely unacceptable. To avoid that problem, the grass is naturally maintained at a growth rate that's a little bit too fast, and then we do a lot of extra work in order to create the surface. But the interesting thing about that is by having that faster growth rate, there is more organic matter that accumulates in the soil. This is a post more about clipping volume because I'm suggesting, or I suggested, when did I write this? Uh, it's got a date of 2020 May. So that's uh, about two years ago I wrote this. And 
I just, this is kind of a philosophical post. I said that the, I'll quote again, quote, the best playing surfaces for golf, at least, are on swords that are growing as slow as possible. That is, they are growing just enough to avoid the problems of growth that is too slow, but they are growing no more than that, end quote. And then I mentioned that clipping volume is an easy way to safely get as close to the optimum growth rate as possible. And I was not talking so much about the organic matter accumulation rate in the soil in this post. I was talking about the clipping volume, but I think it's relevant to some of the things that I've been writing and talking about recently. Those things being that the organic matter in the soil doesn't really need to be managed if it doesn't get created in the first place, if the grass never grows that much. And I remembered this post, this post that I titled, it is easy to know when grass grows too slow. And I, I think it's important to try to grow the grass as slow as possible without any of those problems occurring. And that's where I think clipping volume is really useful because one can can keep track of exactly how much the grass is growing and try to minimize the growth in order to create those superb playing surfaces. You'll see, for example, this upcoming summer at the Open Championship on the old course at St. Andrews. And I have a photo in the post of that turf from the Open Championship in 2010, I believe. Those surfaces are really the optimum surfaces for golf. The ball bounces and it rolls and the ball rolls smoothly across the surface. And it is just a tremendous surface. That's the classic golfing surface. And that happens when the grass is growing at just the right rate. That's a post that I wanted to mention because it ties together the clipping volume and what I've suggested may be happening in the soil. And then the second post I want to talk about is Tom Cook's Extraordinary Lawn, which I had a chance to visit recently. This is a lawn in Corvallis, Oregon, and I made a video about this. You can watch this video on the ATC YouTube channel, and I hope you will, because Tom Cook is, um, well, he... He's really the premier expert on lawns and grasses and what the the species composition of lawns will be in the Pacific Northwest. He's been studying this for a long time. He's now retired from Oregon State University. He taught me and many other people who are now working throughout the, the turf grass industry um, in his career at Oregon State, which I think was from the late 1970s until, oh, sometime around 2010 or so. I, I don't have the years exactly right. Um, I studied at Oregon State University from 1994 until 1998 and was quite fortunate to take many classes from Tom and learn from him as much as I could then. And it's been a treat now to go back and sometimes talk with him about grass on golf courses and grass in his lawn. And when I was in Corvallis, I asked him, could I come by and could we look at your lawn? Can you show me what we talked about on the ATC Office Hours episode where he was, the ga he was my guest talking about lawn ecology in the Pacific Northwest? I wanted to see the grass and shoot a little video and hear from him. And he was kind enough to allow me to do that. And it's, it's really interesting how he does relatively low maintenance on the lawn, but he has bent grass, very little poa annua. He hasn't put fertilizer for 15 years. 15 years, and yet he's still during the growing season, is mowing the lawn every week because there's enough nitrogen in the soil from the organic matter that mineralizes from the nitrogen that is fixed 
and made plant available by some of the clover that he's introduced to the lawn. But you don't really notice this clover very much visually. When you look at the lawn, it looks mostly like grass. You can see in the video what it looks like. It, and it's mostly bent grass. And it has some other species in it, some Holcus lanatus, which is uh, Yorkshire fog, or I think sometimes called velvet grass. And it has a little bit of Poa trivialis in it. He doesn't put herbicides on it. He just uh, removes dandelions and false dandelion uh, by, by knifing them out after he mows. It's really quite fascinating because he talks about what happens in lawns in that part of the world. Because you might plant it to Kentucky bluegrass, or you might plant it to perennial ryegrass, or you might plant the lawn to tall fescue. But as you then manage the lawn for five years and 10 years and 20 years, a completely different set of species comes to grow. In this post, which I'll put a direct link to, and you can watch the video, which, in, which is embedded in that. Um, I think it's a, what is it? It's a 20 minute video about Tom Cook's extraordinary lawn. It's a little bit of me asking him a couple of questions, but mostly it's just Tom sharing his wisdom about what grows, um, what he's learned uh, from managing his own lawn and from observing other lawns. We looked at a neighbor's lawn that had quite a bit of dandelion growing in it, and we talk about why that is, and he shows rat tail fescue, which is Vulpia majoros. That is a annual fescue that germinates in the autumn, and it grows through the winter and then will die in the summer. And he mentioned that in unirrigated lawns, this is a grass that is becoming more and more common. He also has the most amazing uh, collection of Bermuda grasses. Bermuda grass, which we think of as a, well, it is a warm season grass. And we think of it as growing in the South, maybe in South, uh, Southern California, in Arizona, in Texas, in Florida, uh, in Georgia, in, in somewhere from the transition zone down South. I don't think of that as a grass that grows in Seattle or Portland, but Tom has a little bit of Bermuda grass growing in his lawn. And he also has a collection of Bermuda grasses in growing in pots, Bermuda grasses that he has collected from around the Pacific Northwest. He also has a little bit of zoysia growing in a pot. And this was something that I wanted to see because zoysia can grow in Corvallis and in the Willamette Valley. I've been to Milt Engelke's farm and seen plenty of zoysia growing there. And it, it does grow, it can grow, but when you put it in competition with other plants, with other cool season grasses, now you may not have zoysia anymore, especially if you don't irrigate it. Because the temperatures are just too cool, zoysia is not particularly drought tolerant compared to to Bermuda grass. Bermuda grass can uh, withstand longer periods with less water, at least in that climate. And so his Bermuda grass that he planted in his lawn is still persisting, even though it's relatively cold there. And I'll tell you, it was a cold, cold spring day. I was joking. Uh, and you'll see Tom laughing at the start when I mentioned what fine weather it was for us to visit his lawn. I hope you'll watch that video. There have been a few very interesting comments about this. Um, and anyway, it's, uh, it's something that I sure hope uh, to talk about some more with Tom. I'd like to go visit his lawn in the summertime. And in the summer in Oregon, it typically, in Western Oregon, it won't rain for about four months. There's a period that goes from usually June, well, maybe May, June, July, August, September, sometime in that period, it rains quite rarely. And grasses require irrigation during that time if they're going to remain green. And that is one of the primary things, how the lawns are irrigated. That is one of the primary things that puts selection pressure on what species 
are going to form the dominant parts of the sword. And Tom knows all kinds of things about that. And it's something that I went to Willamina, which is not too far from Corvallis. I went over to the Oregon coast and then looped back through Willamina and visited a lawn there. And I saw exactly what Tom and I had been talking about in the morning. Uh, or what he'd explained to me, he explained that in unirrigated lawns, you get a lot of the rat tail fescue and English daisy. Well, I went to this lawn, this un, it, of course, in the photo, it looks like it's, it's plenty green and it's green because it's April in Oregon. The, the soil would be saturated because it rains in the winter. So you typically would have saturated soil conditions from December, January, February, March, um, because you have evapotranspiration that is quite low and you have precipitation that is relatively high. It's common for everything to be green during the winter and then in the summertime it stops raining and the lawn color completely changes and things stop growing. They they go into dormancy or die from drought. Well, I saw this lawn that would have been unirrigated during the summer and it is just it is dominated by English daisy and the rat's tail fescue with just tiny bits of bank grass growing in there. It was quite uh, interesting. So I snapped a photo of that because it, it was just what Tom had been talking with me about. And that or those are the two posts that I wanted to talk about today. The, the one that I consider kind of a classic one, just pointing out or reminding uh, myself and hopefully some other people as well that growing the grass too slow is well I mean the grass dies if it grows too slow you have to have some amount of growth rate if the grass completely stops growing it uh, it's it's an unsuitable surface but we want to get as close as possible to no growth in order to have the best conditions possible I think that that's something that I've often mentioned in, in relation to clipping volume, but I think it's also related to organic matter production also. By making sure that there's enough clipping volume to produce the de desired turf grass surfaces above ground, but minimizing the clipping volume while doing that. So making sure that it's growing enough, but not too much, that is quite likely going to also minimize the below ground accumulation of organic matter and allow for some of these conditions that I've been talking about where the surfaces are quite good, where the surfaces are, uh, let's say, better than expected with less organic, uh, sorry, with less uh, sand top dressing than is typically recommended. So that's that's something that I think is quite interesting, and I'll give you a little preview um, of what's coming up. I'm headed to Spain, so if you're watching this or listening to this, I'm going to go to Spain um, tomorrow, and I'll be there next week. I think, well, actually, I'm going to release this. I'm recording this at home on Friday. I'm uh, just back from a trip to the United States, and I will... Uh, release this early next week when I actually will al already be in Spain if my travel all goes well. And I'm going to visit David Batallé, who is the golf course superintendent at the PGA Catalunya golf course where the European Tour has an event next week. And he's also a turfgrass consultant and advisor to many clubs in multiple countries in uh, to the in my to my knowledge, they're in Southern Europe. Um, there may be a broader geographic range than that. I've had a chance to visit David many times uh, in Spain and learn from him. And these two tournaments, there's back-to-back uh, -back tournaments. He's consulting on the one that's finishing up this week. And then he's the superintendent at the course um, that will be hosting the tournament next week. And these tournaments were announced in February. In, it's now April. That's two months' notice. And it's coming out of winter in that part of the world. So if you're going to be hosting a professional tournament 
on the uh, one of the premier professional tours, and you are coming out of winter, and you only have two months to prepare for it. It's something that I thought would be very interesting for me to go take some of my measuring tools and take a notebook and take a camera and go have a look and see what type of conditions are being produced. David, uh, you may have seen him talk a, a little bit about MLSN and about uh, the minimal disruption practices that he employs when he made a special cameo appearance in the flying blind video that I um, have on my YouTube channel also. In fact, I will reshare one of those clips um, sometime soon. Um, I'll, I'll put a link to that in the show notes in the description also so that you can have a look at that video if you like. Because David is trying to produce excellent conditions all the time without having to do too much disruptive work. Now, if, if those greens have been disrupted, I'm going to find out because I've got my measuring tools and I'm going to, uh, and I've got a camera and I, I will see, but I kind of expect that they're going to be quite good. Um, even, you know, so, so I expect they aren't going to be showing scars from work that was done last year. And I don't think they're going to be showing scars from work that was done in the winter or the spring. And I also expect them to have a suitable firmness and green speed and so and and 100 percent grass cover and minimal poa annua and all those types of things that one would expect on bent grass greens in um in a, a professional tournament like that so stay tuned for that i will probably be talking about that maybe sharing uh some blog posts about that and uh, just keep keep this going with all kinds of interesting things to talk about about turf grass around the world i appreciate you listening and watching this and paying attention to these things i hope that it's useful and i hope that you can get some ideas to help explain what you've been observing um, and help you to have better grass uh, or understand more about how grass may grow for atc in yantikau I'm Michael Woods. Thanks for watching.